everybody, Ryan Jackson here. I hope you're enjoying the 100 days of the 2023 National Electrical Code changes. This is a video that I've not been looking forward to, I'll be perfectly honest. Um, still in Article 680, which of course is swimming pools, fountains, hot tubs, similar. We're in Section 680.26, which is equipotential bonding. Now, that's a subject that I actually usually enjoy talking about. Uh, but there were some interesting things that happened in the 2023 NEC that we have to talk about. The changes in and of themselves uh, aren't bad, but what ended up happening is a tentative interim amendment was issued after the code book was printed, and it's pretty convoluted. I'm going to be perfectly honest with you. And the legality of a tentative interim amendment is always something that you need to check about before you enforce a requirement or before you make an installation to, to ensure that you're going to comply. So a tentative interim amendment, if you're not familiar, is when somebody recognizes an emergency that needs to be addressed outside of the normal code revision process. So as you know, we typically have a process, a you know, three-year revision process that really takes place over the course of about two years between submitting the uh, proposals and voting on them and getting the comments and voting on them and getting the membership to vote and the standards council to approve it and everything else. It's about a you know, two, two and a half year process. But what happens if we find an emergency that needs to be addressed and it's too late? and we don't wanna wait three years for the next opportunity to change the code. Well, what can happen is a person can submit for a tentative interim amendment. Now, a tentative interim amendment uh, has to get 75% of the code making panel to vote yes, which is higher than the normal two thirds, and it has to get 75% of the correlating committee, and it has to go through the standards council. So. Uh, the, the, the baseline for approval is very high for tentative interim amendments. We try not to issue them if we don't have to, but if an emergency address, uh, exists, then, then we need to address it. So I'm going to talk about what changed, and then I'll talk about what happened with the tentative interim amendment. Now, if you have an electronic version of the code, NFPA link, you can see the, the TIA language. If you have an actual printed copy, well, of course, <laughs> we can't magically insert words in a book that's already at your house. So in that instance, you could go to nfpa.org slash 70, right, the NFPA 70, NEC, uh, and go to the tentative interim amendments there if you want to read the actual text. Now, how is it legally adopted? That's always a different question. I can tell you that in my area, uh, we do not adopt tentative interim amendments. So if you were an inspector, you could not legally enforce a tentative interim amendment. If you were an installer, I think it would perhaps be wise to follow the tentative interim amendment because there they are an increase in safety and it's been deemed an emergency. So you'd probably want to follow the TIA. Uh, but again, if you're asking me a, a question of legality, my answer would be, well, the the body that adopts the code probably doesn't legally adopt the TIA. So I just want to throw that out there. The first part of this video is going to be easy. We're going to talk about change in the 2023, which I think was some, some good changes. Then we'll talk about the TIA and, and kind of my thoughts on it. So let's go ahead and jump into it. Article 680, Section 680.26, which is equal potential bonding. So 680.26. Equipotential bonding, equipotential, equipotential, however you want to say it. The location of the perimeter bonding conductor or grid was clarified. All right, now I want to start off with the word equipotential. Equal potential, right? And we do that in the NEC all the time. We'll, we'll take two terms and just kind of combine them together and make a new word. So equipotential means the same, right? The same potential, the same voltage. So if you were to take your voltmeter and touch an energized conductor. I don't care if it's 20 volts or 20,000 volts. If you were to take a conductor and put both of your test leads on that same conductor, the voltage is zero, right? Because voltage is defined as a difference in potential between two objects. If I'm touching the same object, then the voltage is going to be zero. Now, if I were to take that wire and let's say connect it to a piece of steel, just sitting on your desk, a piece of steel, and then you take your voltmeter and measure between the wire and that piece of steel, the voltage is going to be zero because they're connected together, right? So you have an equal potential between that chunk of steel 
and that conductor. That's what we're trying to do around a swimming pool. We want the water itself and everything that we can touch around the swimming pool, we want them to be the same voltage, all right? So the water is 100 volts or one volt, whatever it might be. It doesn't matter if everything around it is the same voltage. So here in the photograph, we've got one test lead in the water and the other test lead is in the dirt, you know, six feet away. And you can see that we've got basically 90 volts measured from the water to what I would call remote earth. Now, I wish I might, if my test lead was a little bit longer and I could have thrown it out 100 feet, it probably would have been 120 volts. So obviously we have a problem here. Now, if I sit my butt on the deck and put my feet in the water, what's the voltage between my feet and, <laughs> and the deck? Well, high enough that it could potentially kill me, quite frankly. So this is what we're trying to address. The bonding required in this section is to reduce voltage differences in and near the pool. Normally, when we talk about bonding, we're talking about running equipment grounding conductors to equipment so that we can trip circuit breakers or open fuses in the event of a ground fault. That's not the type of bonding that this section is talking about. This section is simply talking about taking metal objects, tying them together so that they're all the same voltage. Now, we added language here that says this bonding is required regardless of the presence of electrical equipment for the pool. <clears throat> now, I think that's a good clarification because if you have electrical equipment in the pool, let's say we've got some, uh, some underwater lighting and we've got our pump motor. Well, the utility uses what's called a multi-grounded neutral, all right? So the utility earth grounds their neutral conductor at every pole that has equipment on it and also at a minimum of four points per square mile. So they bond the neutral all over the place. So the dirt itself is in parallel with the neutral. In fact, I was teaching at a power plant a couple of weeks ago and their, their high voltage guys, and when I say high voltage, 500,000 volts DC, uh, their high voltage guys were explaining that when they, if they lose a wire, if they lose a line on their 500,000 volt plus or minus DC, they have about 10 minutes where they will use the earth as the conductor. Now, they don't want to do that for an infinite num length of time, but while they're trying to figure out what happened, <clears throat> they've got about 10 minutes to figure it out, and while they're doing it, uh, they will use the earth as their conductor. So there is current in the earth for a fact. That, that is just a, a function of the way that we do things here in the United States. So we use solidly grounded systems. We use a multi-grounded neutral. There is current in the dirt. So what do we do at the service disconnect? We take the utility, and, and by the way, I should back up. So the utility neutral is connected to the dirt at transmission level voltage, let's say 330,000 volts uh, AC. They take it to a transformer and step it down to you know 100,000 volts and then step it down to 12,470 and down to 240. At all of those transformers, they bond the primary neutral to the enclosure and they bond the secondary neutral <clears throat> to the transformer enclosure. So all the way down the line. So when you go to your house tonight and you touch the neutral inside your service disconnect, that, that really is the utility neutral at transmission level voltage, minus voltage drop. So we take that neutral and we connect it to the service disconnect. And then we take all of our equipment grounding conductors and we connect those to the service disconnect. And then we take all those green wires, those equipment grounding conductors, and we connect them to the metal parts of the pool lights and the swimming pool pump motor, and we throw them in the water. So you essentially have taken the utility neutral and put it in the water, all right? So if you have electrical equipment in your pool, you will have voltage in your pool. That is a fact, and you pretty much can't get rid of it. The only thing you can do is bond everything around the pool <clears throat> and make it all the same voltage so that it's not dangerous. Now, the clarification here says <clears throat> this bonding is required whether you have electrical equipment for the pool or not, and for good reason. Remember, I said how the utility can use the dirt itself as a conductor, and whether they're trying to or not, 
that dirt is in parallel with the neutral. So you don't have to have any electricity associated with your pool to have voltage in your pool. Your pool is in the dirt. The dirt has voltage. Folks, you're, you're going to have voltage in your swimming pool water. There's no, there's no way around it. So the bonding in this section is intended to minimize the difference between two objects that you can touch. The water and the diving board. The diving board and the ladder. The water and the deck around the swimming pool. The pool itself and the observation deck, right? All of those things we want to be the same voltage. So 680.26b says, look, the parts specified in B1 through B7 must be bonded together with a solid conductor that's not smaller than 8 gauge. Okay, so here in the picture, we are showing this uh, metal fence here, and you can see that it has a bonding jumper connected to the fence. So that fence <clears throat> is bonded to the rebar in the swimming pool, and it's bonded to the rebar in the pool deck around the swimming pool, and the ladder, and the handrails, and the observation deck, the diving board, all of that stuff. All right, that way, if I was in the water and I grabbed the fence, I wouldn't get shocked. If the fence is at zero volts and the swimming pool is at 100, well, then I'm going to get 100 volts through me. But if I can tie the water to the fence and make them both 100 volts, well, then touching the water and touching the fence, it's not 100 volts, it's zero. So we need to bond all of these things together with an 8 gauge conductor. Now, in this photograph here, this fence is a little bit farther than the, from the pool than would require bonding. But they decided to, to put some extra safety in place and they went ahead and bonded it regardless. So the parts in B1 through B7 have to be bonded together. That's where you're going to get the pool structure itself and you're going to get the deck around the pool where you walk and you're going to get all of the other metal objects. We're not going to cover all those. We're just going to talk about what changed. There's important language here too that says the bonding jumper is not required to extend to any panel board or grounding electrode or any other equipment that's not specifically mentioned in this section. Folks, we're not trying to trip breakers here. We're not trying to open fuses. We're just, take, we're just trying to take metal objects and tie them together. That's it. So you don't have to run this to a ground rod. You don't have to run it to a panel board or anything else. Uh, here in the photograph, they've taken all of the lights and everything else and, and ran them back to a central location and tied them all together here. That's one way to do it. Okay, so what do I have to bond together? Well, B1, you're gonna guess, is the pool structure itself, the rebar in the pool. Item two is the perimeter surface, or the deck, and this is where all the changes happen. So it says, look, the perimeter surface, the deck of a pool, extends from the water outward three feet horizontally, and it includes both paved and unpaved surfaces. All right, so. Perfect example right here between the hot tub and the swimming pool. If you have your butt sitting on that deck and your feet in the water, you better make sure that that voltage is the same. Because remember, your resistance to electric shock is your skin. And once you get your skin wet, your resistance plummets down to nothing. So lower voltages can yield greater currents, which means a greater shock doesn't take that much in a swimming pool to kill or injure a person. So we want to make sure they're all the same voltages. If a permanent wall that's at least five feet high reduces the perimeter space to less than three feet, then only the side of the wall nearest the pool is considered a perimeter surface. So you've got your pool and it's right next to your house. Well, maybe I've only got a foot and a half worth of deck. Does that mean I need to run a wire under the house and into the living room? <laughs> but, well, obviously not, right? So we're just worried about things that we can touch. So if you've got a wall that, that stops the deck before you've measured three feet, well, then, then so be it. The perimeter surface must be bonded to the other items indicated in 680.26b at a minimum of four uniformly spaced points around the pool. And the perimeter surface must consist of the parts specified in A, B, or C. So A, B, and C give you three different methods on how you can do the deck bonding. So looking at the picture here, we have used option A, which is the steel reinforcing mesh around the pool, like you might find in, in any uh, concrete slab. You'll notice here that they've also bonded with another wire these two ladder cups together. So that's where the ladder interfaces. Those are metal. We want to make sure that is the same voltage as the water 
and the same voltage as the deck. So we've bonded those together. And I'm sure if you could walk around to the other side of this, you would see similar provisions at the diving board or at, again, a fence if it's within five feet. So all of these things have to be bonded together. Option A, structural reinforcing steel. Unencapsulated reinforcing steel tied together by the usual steel tie wires or equivalent. This is uh, probably the easiest way, but you, you install rebar, all right? You install rebar or you install steel mesh in the slab and you're done, all right? Tie that together at four uniformly spaced points. You've got your normal rebar, perfect. That's going to bond the perimeter surface for us. Option B is a copper ring. Now, this option was added, I think, back in 2011, if I'm not mistaken. And it's been somewhat controversial ever since. So instead of having a whole bunch of steel in the concrete, instead, you can take one eight gauge wire and just lay it around the pool. Eight gauge or larger, bare solid conductor must be provided. It has to follow the contour of the pool, and you can see that it does here in this picture. We've got it just kind of lay in there, and we're gonna pour concrete over it. If you splice it, it has to be done exothermically or in a listed way, so these split bolts here are listed. And it has to be installed uh, 18 to 24 inches from the inside wall of the pool. And some clarifications were made here, saying it must be within or below a paved surface, but not more than six inches below grade or four to six inches below grade of an unpaved surface. All right, so it used to say that it basically had to be within the perimeter surface. And I don't think anybody's doing that. Nobody's putting this copper wire actually in the concrete. We're pouring concrete on top of it. So this was just a clarification, which is fine because that you know pouring it on top or within, either way, not a problem. I think most people would agree that this method is not going to be as effective as the steel rebar or the steel mesh, right? The question has always been. Is it good enough? Option B, I think most people would agree, is not as good as option A. But is it good enough? Because if it's good enough, then the code should allow it. So that was the subject of debate for the 2023 code, is, is this wire good enough? Now let's keep on reading and, and we'll kind of keep that in mind because there's one other option and that's option C, a copper grid. If structural reinforcing steel does not exist, or is covered in a non-conductive compound like epoxy, then a copper grid that satisfies the following requirements can also be used. A copper grid has to be at least eight gauge and be arranged in a 12 inch by 12 inch pattern of, pattern of conductors, plus or minus four inches, has to follow the perimeter surface of the pool and extend outward at least three feet. Now, this is not something that you're going to you know, splice together in the field. You, you buy this as a roll, all right? You, you go to wherever you buy your pool stuff, you buy a roll of this copper mesh, and you roll it out around the swimming pool. Uh, from my understanding, you can get it in a three-foot variety, or you can get it in a five-foot variety. So you're going to roll that around your pool. If you splice it, it has to be with listed splicing methods or exothermic welding, which again, we're not going to splice it because we're not going to build it. We're going to buy it in a roll. And it has to be within or below a paved surface, but not more than six inches below grade, or four to six inches below grade of an unpaved surface. All right, so just kind of clarifications, talking about whether or not the perimeter surface bonding has to be in the concrete or below the concrete. Simple enough, right? That's what happened in the 2023 code. Towards the end of the revision process, uh, people started to become aware that there and I'm going to use careful language here. I'm going to, I'm going to turn into lawyer mode here. There were allegedly uh, some incidents that happened that were, that were alleviated by changing the single conductor method to the copper mesh method. All right, so again, the question has never been, is the single conductor equivalent to a whole bunch of conductors or a whole bunch of rebar? It's obviously not equivalent. The question has always been, is it good enough? And testing showed that perhaps that single conductor method is not good enough. And the results of that test didn't come out until it was a little bit too late in the code revision process. 
So they submitted for a tentative interim amendment saying, look, we did some research and we found that this is not adequate. And we have documented incidents of people that are getting shocked and can't use their pool. And when we removed the single conductor and replaced it with, uh, with rebar or with the copper mesh, the issue went away. So don't tell me that it's good enough because obviously it must not be. So that was the argument. Um, a group was created to create a tentative interim amendment and they submitted it. Now, I'm on this code making panel. I, I looked at the tentative interim amendment and I had to vote on it. And a TIA, in my opinion, is supposed to address an emergency. And in my opinion, it should do nothing more than that. So I voted no on this tentative interim amendment. If you want my opinion, um, I support the idea of not using a single conductor. I support that. Um, but I think the tentative interim amendment does more than simply address an emergency. And I don't think the TIA process should be a vehicle for someone to make wholesale changes to a section that aren't necessarily an emergency. So I voted no, but I was in the minority. As it turns out, and you know, I don't know how interested you are in all the behind the scenes stuff, but as it turns out, a tentative interim amendment was issued and I'm gonna bring it up on NFPA link so that we can all see what it looks like. So I'm going to bring up my code book and I'm going to go to NFPA link. Now here, I'm not sure why it's telling me that, this is the revised language, item two, the perimeter surface. And I'm not gonna go through the whole tentative interim amendment, I, I'm not. But I'm just going to show you that it is far more complex than it was in previous versions of the code. And maybe that's a good thing. I don't know, you, you could argue that. But it's definitely more than we had in previous versions. So if you're an inspector and you're in an area that does a lot of swimming pools, well, you might wanna kinda of have a staff meeting and figure out, hey, how are we gonna enforce this? What can we legally do? Uh, because it's tricky. I don't think you can legally enforce things if they're not legally adopted. So get with your city attorney perhaps and find out how your area legally adopts it. If you're, do, if you're a swimming pool contractor, get with the cities, see what they're going to enforce. You know, um, Ultimately, what the, TI does, what the TIA does is it says you either need to use the structural metal, the rebar or steel mesh, or you need to use the copper grid it pretty much removes the option of just using one conductor around the swimming pool. So there you go. I don't know how to make this video any less convoluted than that. That's kind of where we're at. So I hope this answers any questions that you had about what happened with 680.26. Um, we'll definitely talk more about it for the 2026 revision process. Make no mistake there. <laughs> but uh, for right now, that's what we have. So we will see you on the next video. And I hope you have a great day.